One of the greatest legal minds we have in the country currently is a gentleman by the name of Utembega, Mugai Tobi. He wrote an amazing piece in the Mail and Guardian of the 16th to the 22nd of September 2022 on Queen Elizabeth. I know this is a bit late and I should have read this earlier, but reading it again, I just realized how powerful this piece was and I wanted to share it with you guys. Those of you who maybe don't buy the Mail and Guardian, those of you that maybe don't read the Mail and Guardian online. Just going to read this piece. I'm going to end this video. Happy Monday. I hope you'll have a great day. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy watching the latest episode of the Penrill Show and the Virtual Mkuku today. Let's get to it. Elizabeth, an agent of British soft power. The reign of Queen Elizabeth II saw Britain move to put a positive spin on its former colonial project. A comment by Tembega Ngugai Tobi. The age of Queen Elizabeth II has come to an end. Her son, to reign as Charles III, is the new British monarch. A change in the royal family in the area, in the area where republicanism and democracy have gained universal acceptance and rulership by birth has become archaic should yield little interest. Yet it is hard to ignore the legacy of British rule over the native inhabitants of South Africa. Elizabeth II did not found the British Empire, nor did she preside over its extension to Southern Africa. It was her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, who did so. Victoria's first cousin was the Belgian king, Leopold II, whose rule over the Congo created economic and social prosperity for Belgium, but brought utter ruin for the Africans there. Victoria's reign was the most consequential for Southern Africa. She built the British Empire. It was during her reign that the British came to create and dominate the world trade in gold and diamonds. When Victoria died in 1901, the British had opened a new frontier of war, not against the indigenous people of South Africa, but with another occupying force, descendants of the Dutch, the Afrikaners. That war ended in defeat for the Afrikaners but it created conditions for the establishment of a white racial oligarchy that would rule South Africa until 1994. Alfred Kuma, the president of the ANC, observed that apartheid was simply a variation of white rule, not its invention. Victoria's success in the consolidation of the British Empire is evident not only by the vastness of the territory that the British acquired under her reign, but at the social, cultural, and normative changes to the people affected by British rule. Their language, religion, and cultural aspirations was so fundamentally changed that even the language of protest against the colonial empire mimicked the aesthetics of the empire itself. African deputations and petitions by the Victorian-educated African elite to England proclaimed their status as African children of the empire. Inyembeziziga Vitolia, Victoria's Tears, a hard alcohol, entered the Isi class of vocabulary as something pleasurable despite its destruction. It was the Victor in the Victorian era that the British annexed Transvaal, placing the Pedi and the Boers under their control, finally defeated the Kosa in 1878 and in the brutal wars of Natal in 1879, avenged their defeat at Isandlwana and colonized the Zulus under the British sphere of influence. When the deposed king of the Zulus, Sechwayo visited England in 1882 to plead for the restoration of his kingdom, it was with Victoria that he met, a meeting which left him a vassal king, compelled to enforce imperial desires and wishes over the Zulu people. Victorianism was good for business too. Not only did British citizens Cecil John Rhodes and Barney Bonato influence the diamond and gold trade in the Cape and Transvaal, but their fortunes were amassed with the help of the imperial government, becoming super-rich capitalists. When Rhodes duped the king of the Ndebele, Lobengula, to obtain the mineral-rich land of the Ndebele, he could rely on Victoria to sponsor a war and to declare the land as crown land controlled by Rhodes. 
In South Africa, what had begun 50 years earlier as a truce out of the Anglo-Boer War in 1901 had consolidated into apartheid. Although no longer a formal colonial power, British influence in politics and social and economic infrastructure were evident. British possessions acquired under colonialism remained intact. When Elizabeth became queen in 1953, the empire was at an ebb. India had successfully agitated for independence. The opponents of British interests, such as the Mau Mau in Kenya, were also fought with brutality. Caroline Elkins, in her book, Britain's Gulag, The Brutal End of Empire in Kenya, has shown the depraved violence of British soldiers in the suppression of the Mau Mau fight for freedom, such as the torture of detainees in Kenyan concentration camps. The complicity of the British government in the violence resulted in a successful class action lawsuit for reparations that was only resolved a couple of years ago in British courts. Elizabeth's first Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, was an arch or arch imperialist. Towards the end of World War II, he had resisted attempts by the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, to extend the central principle of the Atlantic Charter, all people shall have a right to self-determination, to Africans under British rule. Churchill was not prepared to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. Elizabeth's declaration in Cape Town when she was 21 that she would devote her life to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong would have done nothing to assure the native people of South Africa of her commitment towards their freedom from apartheid. Elizabeth, unlike Victoria, presided over the transformation of Britain's relations with its former colonies. The British government was no longer interested in imposing its own governors to rule the colonies. The colonies could be independent, provided that their newfound freedom would not threaten Britain's economic interests. Hence, many constitutions of the newly independent states of Africa in the 1960s protected private property, assets obtained under colonial rule by European corporations and individuals, including land. The Commonwealth of Nations enabled Britain to continue overseeing her interests in the former colonies. The approach of the British government towards the natives of South Africa did not change significantly in the early decades of apartheid. Paul Landau's recent book, Spear, Mandela and the Revolutionaries, lays bare the collaboration between the apartheid intelligence services, the British Foreign Intelligence Service, known as MI6, and the United States CIA, which worked to foil the efforts of the ANC's freedom fighters from as far afield as Botswana. Bob the Quehen of MI6 watched Africa's clamor for independence with asperity and trepidation, and it was the CIA's Durban agent, Don Ricard, who provided information to the local security branch leading to the arrest of Nelson Mandela near Hawick on the 5th of August 1962. Her Majesty's government was preaching one thing and doing the opposite. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was talking about the wind of change, but Her Majesty's agents were working to preserve British hegemony in Africa. The greatest impact of Elizabeth has not been to influence the change of British policy towards the native people of South Africa, but to make British soft power more palatable to the former colonies and the world. The complexity of the world brought about by the end of the Cold War and the emergence of China as a global power with an interest in Africa demanded a new approach. A new vocabulary, new normative systems, and new cultural norms were emerging. History books such as Neil Ferguson's Empire, How Britain Made the Modern World, repackaged the story of empire. Now, British colonial power was projected as a good thing, including for the inhabitants of the former colonized territories. The civilizing mission, which was the justification of most of the atrocities committed by the British in Africa, was now replaced with apparently neutral terms such as progress, modernity, and the free world. The British Empire remains in diffuse, invisible, but in but significant forms. Elizabeth's last Prime Minister, Liz Truss, appointed the first Chancellor 
of the exchequer with Ghanaian roots, Kwasi Kwateng, its self-evidence of the mastery of British imperial adaptability to new conditions. A few years ago, Kwateng published the acclaims, acclaimed Ghosts of Empire, Britain's Legacies in the Modern World, in which he examines the shameful legacy of the British in Asia and West Africa. He would recall too Elizabeth's ambivalence towards the independence of Ghana. Much of the poverty of black Africans is attributable to the policies of the British Empire, the institution of slavery, the violent seizure of the land, the confiscation of cattle, the extraction of minerals and forced labor in British-controlled firms. These have created a life of affluence for British citizens and massive wealth for British corporations. Those legacies have proved difficult to reverse with conventional policies. Perhaps first on the agenda of the new monarch, Charles III, is to go beyond the Elizabethan modus operandi of lip service to the plight of Africa, accepting the wrongs of the past, yet never committing to tangible corrective action. England could look at how Germany is attempting to exorcise its own imperial demons in Namibia by putting its money where its mouth is, paying reparations to the indigents for the wrongs of the colonial era. Empty gestures about strengthening trade relations with Africa, where there are embedded structural trade imbalances as a result of historical practices, will not erase the stain of colonial plunder of African resources. Tembe Gangugai Tobi SC is a lawyer and author of Land Matters, South Africa's Failed Reforms and the Road Ahead. The views expressed are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Mail and Guardian. I think as my voice becomes more powerful on social media, on YouTube and other platforms, it's going to be very imperative for me to spend more time getting in-depth analyses and thoughts from the news. That means reading newspapers such as the Mail and Guardian and others. And it means watching news channels, channels like Al Jazeera, CNN, Fox, and even the ones that we have at home, ENCA, Newsroom Africa, SAPC, and others. Because I think it's going to be fundamentally important that as I influence minds, as I shift minds, as I get people to reawaken mentally so that they can reawaken their bodies and do for self and be self-sustaining, that I have the right content and information at my disposal. In reading this piece, the first important thing that should stand out for you is the fact that Queen Victoria was the one who was the Queen Paus who colonized all these nations. And Elizabeth, if anything, according to Ungugai Tobis, basically was basically expected to be like, look, we, we oppressed you, we exploited you, we took from you, but we're now coming to just rub you softly and say, you know, things will be okay, but not necessarily to change anything, not necessarily to redistribute the wealth, not to unpack and revolutionize and re-engineer the laws that we have and the policies that we have that continue to oppress the people of, let's say, South Africa, the masses at the very least. The other very interesting thing as I listen is how the British have done very well, not only with the Afrikaners to get them to mimic the British rulers before them, but even the black leaders we have today. If you look at people like the two representatives of South Africa that were at the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II, Cyril Ramaphosa and Naledi Pando, you look at how polished they are, how well they are grasp of the English language is. Not only the English language, but English culture and English manner of being and an English way of leadership. We have got leaders in this country who are just British puppets, who are English in everything but skin color, where they are black. And the same can be said of some of our tribal leaders. Uzueli Teen used to wear something that mimicked a British uh, army um, uniform. He was a devout Christian. You can see in his children, they have a good grasp of English as well. And they have been taught at some of these colonial schools that we have today. That is the leadership that we have. And obviously, as black South Africans in particular, people need to ask themselves, is this what we want? Do we want a more African way of living and being? What does that fundamentally look like? Or do we want to accept that we will assimilate to being British citizens or British people that are just dark skinned? And we will make sure that we have the high tees and we will play the rugby and go and do rowing. And of all the clubs, just like the British that came to colonize us uh, before. It's a lot of thoughts we need to think about. 
in the conversation I had with the men in Butweni Bakery, Osizweni in Newcastle, um, one of the conversations I had was the fact that I really desire a Codesa 2.0 with a younger generation, not the old people, not politicians, not business people, but a younger generation. And what future do we want for this country? How can we turn South Africa in particular, if it will remain a sovereign state, how can we turn it into a world-leading economy? In the same way, the Springboks are a world-leading rugby team. And what will that take? What do we need to assimilate to? What do we need to scrap and get rid of? And how do we need to psychologically, physically engineer South Africans so that they become powerful workers? Powerful workers that are fundamental game changers across the economic landscape in the world. This is some of the hard work that we need to do. I hope you have a blessed Monday. I hope you have a great week. Please remember to work very, very hard. Enjoy this happy new year month of spring in September as it ends at the end of this week. On Friday on the 30th of September, I will be speaking at Munate in Maboneng and I'm hoping that some of you will join me. I will be posting the link to the event uh, in the description. You can click there and you can book to come and sit with me for a couple of hours and we can discuss politics, economics, education, and how we can change our existence and our world for the better. Penuel the Black Pen. Cheers.